There is no other word to describe the BIOS trilogy of games. Starting back with BIOS Genesis, we cover the twinkle of life in the universe's eye. In BIOS Megafauna, we move on to the land and our beasts battle for control and survival. Until finally, right here in BIOS Origins, we observe the dawn of humanity, beginning with prehistory all the way up to the now. BIOS Origins is a civilization game through and through. Players will be developing the minds, the brains of their people and putting the most talented of them to work, inventing ideas and shaping the path of their civilization. We cover everything from the development of industry to the invention of war and the clashes that come from that. Like the other two games, this is a complex game and requires a thorough understanding of the games, the basics, to even get it to the table. And this, that's what this video is going to provide and much more. I want to get you table ready with more than a basic understanding of this game. And that's what this is all about. By the end of this video, I want you to be able to sit down and try your hand at this beast of a game. <laughs> You ready? Let's get in. BIOS Genesis is a game for one to four players. Over the course of a game, players will take turns and on their turn they will complete three phases of gameplay. The challenge, activities, and footprints and restore market phases. In the challenge phase, players may interact with the challenge deck, either challenging the gods or claiming a comet card, or they may perform globalization. Throughout the activities phase, a player may perform a number of actions or advancements on cards in their tableau. Finally, in the footprint and restore market phase, players will resolve any overcrowding issues with their pieces on the map and restore the marketplace. The game end is immediate. As soon as a player takes the fourth comet in the challenge deck, they initiate final scoring and the player with the most victory points wins. But before we go into scoring, let's have a quick tour of the play area. Here we have a player's brain placard and species placard. The brain placard houses a player's pawns spread across the three domains of the brain. The species placard is a player's tableau. It will display a player's current ruling class, any foundations added, and any ideas they have invented. During the activity phase, players will take actions in the column of their current ruling class. Here we have the challenge deck, containing both challenge cards and comet cards. Challenge cards contain events which affect players and the game world itself. Once they are resolved during the challenge phase, they are then auctioned off to players who can then take them and add them to their tableau as foundations. A player who wins the auction will gain any Eureka bonuses, and then provided they meet the requirements for the card, will add them to their tableau. A challenge card has two orientations, relating directly to the ruling class options available on each player's species placard. When gained, a player will place the challenge card as a foundation under one of the disciplines matching an orientation. If they place the card in a discipline matching their current ruling class, they simply place the card and play continues. If, however, a player chooses to place a different orientation, this causes a quiet revolution and the ruling class changes. Each orientation has activity icons that a player can use during the activities phase and also a rainbow space that can either be a descent space or not. Comet cards signify the end of an epoch, pushing the game further towards its conclusion. The reverse side of the comet card is the bellwether card and is used as a part of globalization. Next we have the idea decks split across the three disciplines. These are further split into epochs, just like the challenge cards. Idea cards, just like challenge cards, may contain a Eureka action, as well as requirements for the card to be added to a player's tableau. These two have orientations providing actions if the idea card is ever taken and added as an invention. Now, our advanced game also contains a separate discard deck to the cards that are usually removed from the game, and this is called the Lore Deck. 
Basically, this is a deck of discarded ideas that's gathered throughout the game and usable in a science or pseudoscience elder action. All of that we'll cover later on, but it's just worth remembering that yes, there is a difference between removing cards from the game and discarding to the lore deck. The map is where players will duke it out, placing their cities and migrants across the board. Migrants are used to spread across to different locations and will be expended should a player ever place a city. The map is made up of hexes, with each hex surrounded by up to six spots that can house a player's migrants. Spots will either be land or sea, with each connecting to up to three other spaces. Hexes themselves contain a bit of information as well. A coloured climate circle indicates that the space is eligible to have a climate sheet of the matching colour. Some of these climate circles contain stars, which direct the map setup at different player counts. Hexes also contain symbols that are useful for a player during urbanization and represent different commodities used to prop up their civilization. White symbols represent cultivation, brown symbols represent domestication of animals, and black symbols represent the ability to prospect. Some hexes contain a 20 point star, which indicate that it's possible for the hex to suffer a catastrophe over the course of the game. The map also contains a number of tracks that players will use to determine victory come the end of the game. These tracks are split across the three disciplines, culture, politics, and industry. The culture section of the board contains trackers for players' mysticism, represented by pawns moved from their brain placard, and also their progress on their environment tracks, both footprint and energy. The politics track contains trackers to measure a player's urbanization and their welfare consisting of both a metallurgy track and an immunology track. Finally, the industry section of the board tracks a player's diversity, the number of rainbows present on their tableau, as well as their progress in the economy, represented by the maritime track and the information track. The last board element that we should mention is the philosophy track, which can be altered throughout the game, moving the philosophy cube along the different wings of the track, matching the three disciplines of the game. We have industry, politics, and culture. Now, scoring in this game is tricky to predict. There are three pathways to a good final score, but it's possible that only two will be active come the end of the game. And players, well, they may not even know how things will end up until it's too late to change tactic. When game end finally does roll around, players will calculate up to three scores, with the highest one being their final score. First is the cultural score, which awards points for mysticism built up in the early game, mysticism maintained until the end of game, and the progress across the environment tracks. Political final score awards points for urbanization achieved at the midpoint of the game, urbanization maintained come the end of game, and of course progress across the welfare tracks. The final scoring method is the industrial score, awarding points for diversity built up along the late game, diversity maintained at the very end game, and finally progress made on the economy tracks. Now it is worth noting that points awarded for position on the different game tracks are awarded based on the number in the final resting position of a player's cube, and that not all tracks are created equal. Welfare has a top of 6 and a top of 10, Environment has two tops of 8, and Industrial has an 8 and a 6. Like I said though, it's possible that not all of these scoring options will be available come the end of the game, and that is determined by the cube position on the philosophy track. Now let's go ahead and set up. Bios Origins comes with a number of variants to aid in its replayability and to alter the complexity of the game. We have a basic game mode for learning, and then we have the advanced game mode, which introduces a number of additional rules. Across these modes, you can choose to play a competitive or co-op game with a standard or extended length. Next, you may choose to play as land-based or marine life forms, use a set or custom map, continue a campaign from the completion of a game of BIOS Megafauna, or even go solo. There is quite a lot. For us, we'll be setting up for an advanced, competitive, standard length, set map, land-based game. 
let's begin with the player areas. First, randomly assign each player a colour and give them their species and brain placards. In our case, land side up. Next, we place our seven pawns across the three domains of the brain. Four in emotions, two in vocabulary, and one in free will. These pawns represent our species brain power, with the higher domains representing a more complex and capable mind. Finally, next to our placard, we place a pool of migrants. And that's it for the player area. Next, we move to the map. Firstly, we alter setup based on our player count, covering specific hexes with climate chits. We investigate each printed climate ring, and we cover the space if the ring displays a number of stars equal to or greater than our player count. We are setting up for a four player game, so we're only going to cover hexes with four stars. Any remaining chits can be kept off to the side. Next, players place a starting migrant in their starting spot as marked on the map and their brain placard. There should be two spots in the same colour as the player's piece, but as we're playing land-based, we're going to place our migrant onto the brown land option. Moving on, we're now going to place our coloured cubes. Six go into the first stage of each technology, with our last going into the diversity track in Space 1. Next, we have our cuboids, which we'll use to fill up our urbanisation track 1 through 10. Then to finalise our setup of the map, we're going to place the purple philosophy cube in the centre space of the philosophy track. Next, we need to set up the decks. We begin with the challenge deck. Here we take a number of cards from each epoch specific challenge deck to form the deck we actually use in game. The number of cards we take depends on how many players are participating as well as whether the advanced game is being played or not. But for our four player advanced game, we're going to take six epoch one challenge cards, three epoch two challenge cards, three epoch three challenge cards, and three epoch four. Under each selection of cards, we're going to place the Epoch's associated Comet card, and then we're going to stack the decks, with Epoch 4 cards being on the bottom, and Epoch 1 cards being on the top. Finally, we're going to go ahead and offset each of the Comet cards 90 degrees, so that players can sort of keep track of where they are in any given stage of the game. On to the Idea Market decks. Here we have our three markets, and they are each split, just like the challenge cards, into the four epochs used across the game. We'll go ahead and shuffle each, and place them next to the game board in a 3x4 grid. Now, if you, like me, are pressed for space, you can go ahead and stack the Epoch 2 cards on top of Epoch 3, and then that stack on top of Epoch 4, because we're going to need to create a marketplace full of cards below each column. You'll draw three cards from each Epoch 1 deck and lay them beneath continuing the column. This is the marketplace. Almost done, we go ahead and place a supply of victory point chits in reach of all players. And finally, determine play order by randomly handing out the crown chits. These chits are numbered 1 to 4. And for games less than four players, you'll be returning any numbers greater than your player count to the game box. So for example, in a two-player game, only chits one and two are used. Each crown chit has a colour matching one of the disciplines, whether culture, politics, or industry, and will be placed on the ruling token position on each player's species placard. Now the only numbers that matter here are really one and four. One will be the first player, with play continuing to their left, going clockwise around the table. The player receiving the fourth token, as compensation for sharing the same ruling class as the start player, will immediately take an encephalize action. Now we'll go through all the actions later, but for now I will tell you this one moves one pawn from their emotions section of the brain to their vocabulary. Everybody then flips their crown token face down to its descent side, and we are now ready to begin. Players will, on their turn, complete three phases of gameplay before moving on to the next player. Now, while there's a lot to consider here, and there's a lot for us to go through, the decision can be easily made based on the current state of the game. There's just a lot of background knowledge to absorb first. So let's begin with Phase 1, Challenge the Gods. It's in this phase that players interact with the challenge deck. 
They can either choose to make a challenge, claim a comet card, perform globalization, or skip the phase entirely. Now here it's worth knowing that the options to make a challenge or claim a comet card are never present at the same time, as they depend on what the top card of the challenge deck is. If it's a challenge card, challenge. If it's a comet, claim it or not. Making a challenge reveals the top card of the challenge deck, causing all its events to resolve against all players. Then the card is auctioned with players' elders or emissaries used as currency. The winner adds the card to their tableau as a new foundation and may utilize it throughout phase two, the activities phase. As the challenge action requires an auction, for a player to be eligible to make a challenge in the first place, they must have at least one elder or emissary with which to bid. The second option, claiming a Comet card, causes a kind of intermittent scoring. First, each player suffers what is known as chaos, the marketplace is renovated and restored, and then players receive victory chits depending on the stage of the game being completed. These phases tie in directly with the three different scoring methods mentioned earlier. Finally, globalization allows a player to discard one or more of their bellwether cards, allowing the player to move on the philosophy track one or two spaces per card in any direction. As you saw, these bellwether cards are the opposite side of the comet cards and are awarded to the player who claimed it. So what does all this mean? Why would a player want to build their tableau? And why would they want to move on the philosophy track? I got your back. Firstly, foundations are the cornerstone for a player's activities phase. For every card in a player's tableau in the column matching their ruling class, they are allowed to take an action or make an activity. These allow a player to progress on the different technology tracks, interact with the board, and even begin developing their budding civilization. So far we've only seen the philosophy track, and it is a complex beast. Not only does it provide additional bidding power in these challenges, like we saw before it also has a direct hand in what scoring methods are available in the endgame, but it's even got a third use, altering some of the more powerful transaction activities available throughout the game. But more on all that later. For now, let's just concentrate on getting phase one under the belt. <laughs> The first option available to us is Challenge. Yes, it allows for players to build their tableau through auctions, but it's also the main driver for the game's event system. Each challenge causes two events performed left to right, and they can be any of the following. Disease, Catastrophe, Cooling, Warming, Deforestation, Forestation, Pollution, Famine, Crisis, or Dictator. Now before we go into how each of these events resolve, we're just going to solidify a couple of terms we've been throwing around, namely Elders, Chaos, Dissidents, and Revolution. Elders refer to both Elders and in our advanced game, Emissaries as well. Elders are pawns taken from the brain placard and placed on ideas in the marketplace prior to the card being invented and possibly added to a player's tableau. Elders are a prerequisite for the card's purchase, and therefore absolutely integral to a civilization's development over the course of the game. On top of that, they're also used in bidding as we mentioned earlier, and we'll cover that properly in just a sec. Invented ideas go into a player's tableau, leaving them open for other players' emissaries. An emissary is a pawn as well, just like an elder. Except instead of inhabiting cards in the marketplace, they inhabit invented ideas in other players' tableau. Emissaries once in place grant their owner negotiation bonuses whenever the card is used to make an action or an activity. That one? Yeah, that's a later thing. <laughs> Next we have Chaos. Chaos is a negative effect whereby a player removes a migrant from the board and places it on a card in their tableau in a space known as a Descent. These are the rainbow spaces in the corner of cards which have an outline of a migrant. Now migrants when placed in their Descents become known as Dissidents and represent the population opposed to their current ruling class. Basically uncovered Descents equal happy population and covered equals cranky. Dissidents may build up over time and actually prevent players from utilizing the effects of the card in their tableau. So if a player wants to get their actions back, they're going to have to get rid of them. One way a player can get rid of them is through revolution, of which there are two kinds. If a player chooses as part of their challenge action, they may cause a quiet revolution. But if a player is ever required to place more dissidents than they have room for them, well, 
it causes a chaotic revolution. Revolutions in general first cause a player to quell, removing all dissidents from their tableau. Then, for each one they remove, they must either expend an elder, an emissary, or destroy a city. Once the quell is completed as a part of a chaotic revolution, the ruling class changes based on the last card added to the player's tableau. They flip the card to its inverse side, move their ruling class token, and then attempt to reorient any of their existing ideas. In this case, the idea cannot be reoriented, so it has a matching ruling class, so it is discarded to the lore deck. Any invented idea containing an emissary that cannot be reoriented has the emissary expended, returning it to their owner's free will. All right, so with the basics laid out, let's have a look at our different events. We begin with disease, which can come in two forms, both of which have the same effect, but occur under different circumstances. Crowd diseases like Ebola here affect players with a greater urbanization level than their current immunology state. Zoonotic is similar, however, it only affects players with a greater footprint stage than their immunology stage. Now, whenever a player is affected by a disease, they must destroy half their cities and expend half their elders. Now, in case of rounding, they can round whichever way they want in their favour. And then, kind of as a reward, I guess, they get to advance one step in the immunology stage. Now, it is important to note here that advancement only occurs if you're affected by the disease based on the rules we just spoke about, but affects whether or not you actually lose something. So in the case that a player only has one city and one elder, they can choose to round the half to zero. So they're affected, and while they don't lose anything, they're still eligible for the increase in immunology. Next is the Catastrophe event, which occurs on the map in a hex with a matching Catastrophe name. This event destroys the city if one is present, and also any migrants on the spots surrounding the hex. Additionally, if this hex has a climate chit, it is removed by the challenging player, flipped, and then placed back down on the map in another hex with a newly matching climate ring. And if there's a city in that hex, it is destroyed as well. So here we have Lisbon Earthquake. Now, after a moment of looking and then a quick check with the living rules, apparently the Lisbon Earthquake does not exist on this map. So it's actually been removed as a part of the errata. So instead, we will use the Tambora eruption, which is over here. And so if there was a city there, it would be removed. Or if instead there was a climate chit, that would be removed. The challenging player would flip it and place it wherever they would like. Next we have events 3, 4, 5 and 6. Cooling, warming, deforestation and forestation. In these events the challenging player removes a climate chit of their choice matched with the event, flips it and places it in a new location with a newly matching climate ring, destroying any city present. It's just the same as if a climate chit was present during a catastrophic event. Cooling events convert a sea tile to an ice tile, with warming doing just the opposite. Deforestation, as you might guess, converts a forest chit to a desert chit, with forestation doing again just the opposite. Now, in our advanced game, we have what's called the Milankovitch Cycles, a rule directing the challenging player to draw a secondary card whenever a cooling or warming event is drawn as a part of their challenge. These secondary cards are drawn from the matching Epoch deck of unused cards set aside during setup. So here we have a cooling event from Epoch 3. We draw an Epoch 3 card and we assess it to see if there is another cooling event. If there is, the world becomes an ice house and we flip all existing sea chits into ice chits, placing them across the map. Now it's the same for warming events. You'll draw a new epoch from the unused cards, and if that too has a warming event, you'll convert all ice chits into sea chits. Now, if a Milankovic draw is required, and the player is unable to flip the chits that they need, the player instead removes and flips a single climate chit of another type. If warming is required, and all of the ice chits have already been flipped to sea, a forestation event is completed instead. And vice versa, if cooling is required and all sea chits have already been flipped to ice, the player completes a deforestation event 
instead. Next up we have the pollution event, affecting players whose urbanization stage is greater than their energy stage. These players suffer one chaos and either destroy one city or expend one elder. Next up we have the famine event, affecting players whose urbanization stage is greater than their footprint stage. These players must destroy half their cities and expend half their elders, as usual rounding in their favour. Our next event is Crisis, whose effect depends on the current position of the Philosophy Cube. If the cube is in the right wing, it causes genocide. Here players compare a count of their dissidents to their mysticism. If they have more dissidents, they must remove a foundation from their tableau out of the game. If the Philosophy Cube is in the left wing, it causes an economic crisis. Here players count their dissidents, this time adding it to their current mysticism, and if the total is greater than their urbanization, they suffer to chaos. Finally for this one, if the cube is in the center or upper wing, it causes a civil war. Here players should first adjust their diversity track to reflect the total number of visible rainbows on cards in their tableau. Then any player with dissidents equal to or greater than their diversity suffers to chaos. The final event is the Dictator event, which basically forfeits the card's auction and determines the player who will take it. There are two types of Dictators determined by the direction the fist is facing in its icon. If it's pointed to the left, the card is awarded to the player with the most dissidents. If it's pointed to the right, it instead goes to the player with the most mysticism. Now ties are of course possible, and in this case the card would be awarded to the winning player closest to the challenging player in clockwise order. Here all Dictators have a special Eureka ability known as Purge, but we'll cover those abilities later. All that you need to know now is that a challenge card's Eureka is resolved after completion of the auction. Right, so on a challenge the gods phase, we flip the card, we resolve its events left to right, and then we bring the card to auction. So we'll cover that now. Starting with the challenger, each player will have the opportunity to bid on the challenge card for it to be added to their tableau as a foundation. This is a once around auction, beginning with the challenger moving clockwise, with every player having the opportunity to either bid or pass. Players will be bidding using their elders and emissaries, with the bid value actually being augmented depending on the card being auctioned and the current global philosophy. If a challenge card is religious, indicated by the star next to their epoch, a player's bid is automatically increased by the value of their mysticism. Then depending on the global philosophy, each player gains one additional bidding power if their ruling class matches the philosophy's favoured discipline. One big thing to note here is that a player must bid at least one elder or emissary to be eligible for either of these augmentations. You cannot win based on the augmentation alone. Spent emissaries are removed from other players' tableaus, while your elders are removed from the market cards and returned to their players' free will. Once the auction is won, but before it is entered as a foundation, the card's Eureka advancements will take place. These mainly alter the placement of pawns in a player's brain placard, but we'll cover them all in detail later. Once Eurekas are done, the player should check the requirements for the card, and if they meet those requirements, the card must be added to the player's tableau. Let's take a look at all the different requirements that can pop up as a symbol. The first of these is menopause. Presence of this symbol requires a player to have two or less pawns in the emotion domain on their brain placard. The second type of requirement is a technology requirement. For this card to be added as a foundation, the player must have at least two points in the information technology track. These requirements also appear on idea cards, which we'll cover shortly. And in addition to the two types we just looked at, can also have a city type requirement. City type requirements require a player to have a city standing on the resource indicated. So over here, the saddle and stirrups idea requires a player to have domesticated war animals. That is, placed a city on a hex with a matching symbol. This symbol here, on the other hand, means any resource. Back to adding our foundation, a player must determine which orientation the card is placed. If the orientation matches that of their current ruling class, they do nothing but add the card. 
If it does not, they complete a quiet revolution. That is, they move their ruling class token to the new ruling class, quell any dissidents in their tableau, losing an elder or a city for each, and then finally attempting to transfer any ideas if present. Right, so with auctions done, let's take a look at our second option during phase one, claiming a comet. This action can only be taken if the top card of the challenge deck is a comet. Here, the active player may claim the comet card, moving the game into the next epoch. This is resolved in five steps. Firstly, Future Shock Chaos. Beginning with the active player, each player suffers one chaos. Next, the player renovates the market, removing all cards in the marketplace with no elders on them, and removing all decks relating to their previous epoch. Next, the market is restored, drawing cards from the epoch next in line. The next step is to complete Comet Scoring. Here, players gain victory chits based on their standing against other players in the game areas dictated by the Comet card. Players will compare values gaining one victory chit for each player with less in that value, placing the chits in a select space on the board. Comet 1 has all players compare their mysticism, with players placing their chits in their coloured spaces in culture. Comet 2 has players compare urbanisation, with players placing their chits in politics. Comet 3 has players compare their diversity, placing their chits in industry. And finally, Comet 4 leads into final scoring, with each player's victory chits providing one victory point across the three areas of scoring. The last thing for a player to do after claiming a Comet is to take the Comet card, flipping it to its bellwether side. This will be used in the very next option for Phase 1, Globalization. It's in this action whereby a player can cash in as many Bellwether cards as they would like to influence the philosophy track, allowing them to move one or two spaces for each card removed. Once a player has carried out their choice of action in the Challenge of the Gods phase, it's time for them to move into phase two, the Activities phase. Here a player resolves activity icons listed in the ruling class column of their species placard. These activities are performed in order from cards situated on the bottom to the top of the tableau. Activities can be found on foundations, the species placard itself, and also on any invented ideas gained throughout the game. A player can take one activity per row, with each foundation card counting as one row, we have two rows on the placard, and finally, just one row for every invented idea. Now, there are a few points to note here. If a card contains a dissident, its activities are not available to activate. Additionally, some cards show a consequent, an arrow, pointing to an activity that must be taken if the preceding activity is taken. Finally, and this goes throughout the entire phase, if at any time an action causes a player to suffer a revolution, their turn is over immediately with player moving directly to the footprint and restore market phase. Now because from this point of the game we'll be activating inventions, it's time to talk about emissaries. We'll cover how to create them a little bit later, but for now all you need to know is that if a player has placed their emissary on one of your inventions, they will gain a negotiation bonus if that card is activated during this phase. That bonus is one of the following three things. The first, they may gain an advancement in a technology in which they currently lag behind the player making the activation. The second is they may move a pawn from emotions or vocabulary into the free will domain of their brain. The third option is they may clear one chaos, removing a dissident from their board. Alright, with that said, let's take a look at each of the activities available to us. The first four will cover Specialize, Invent, Library, and Elect are some of the main actions in the game and are featured on the Species placard across all disciplines. The specialization activity allows players to place elders on the ideas in the market. A player will take a number of pawns from the free will section of their brain placard and place them across ideas as they see fit. With the maximum number you're allowed to place during a specialized activity equal to a player's current information stage. These pawns, now elders, are required for the invention of ideas as well as the payment for new foundations in auctions. Auctions we've seen. But Invention, we'll cover that one right now. 
the invent activity allows a player to take a card from the marketplace where they have at least one elder, either discarding it or adding it to their tableau. Once a card is selected, the inventing player must take its Eureka advancements as listed. Then if any other player had their elder on the card as well, they will take a copycat Eureka action, gaining the card's advancements as well. Players' elders are returned to their free will, and the card is removed from the marketplace. If the player meets the card's requirements, the card can be added to a player's tableau as an invented idea, but they can also choose to discard the card to the top of the lore deck instead. Now we're about to cover all of the Eureka advancements, but first we should cover a possible additional cost known as Cull. If Cull is mentioned prior to an advancement, a player must discard an idea card from their tableau, placing it on the lore deck. Cull 1, as seen here, requires an Epoch 1 card to be discarded, while Cull 2 requires an Epoch 2. That said, let's go ahead and cover our advancements. The first is Encephalize, which we've seen before on the number 4 crown shit. This one causes a player to move a pawn from emotions into vocabulary. The next advancement is Abstraction, which moves a pawn from vocabulary into free will. The next is Art, which moves a pawn from mysticism into free will. And then there's Prayer, which moves a pawn from any domain of the brain into mysticism. The next advancements are technology advancements and relate directly to our six technology tracks. It will have the technology symbol preceded by a number. This card here allows a player whose information is under six to move up one step on the track. As our orange cube is at stage two, lower than stage six, it moves up one notch. Noting here that it doesn't move up to six, it just goes up one space if it's under. Now, technology activities may actually cause additional bonuses, depending on where a player is at on some of their other tracks. If a player advances into stage six or stage seven on the energy track, they also gain a bonus advancement on one of the other tracks as well. The next advancement is Demigog, which allows a player to move the philosophy cube one step in any direction. And lastly, we have Purge, which is only present on the Dictator cards. This advancement causes all previous cards in the column it is placed to be discarded along with their dissidents. Cool, so they are our advancements, and as you might have seen already, they can also appear as activities on cards or as seen here on the player's tableau. And before we go on to the rest of these activities, I think that it's best that we take a moment to look at the special Elder actions. These are actions that are only available in the advanced game. The first, Exogamy, allows the activating player to take a pawn from their free will and place it as an emissary on an invented idea in another player's tableau. That, right there, is the only way to get emissaries. Racism allows the activating player to expend an opponent's emissary from an invented idea in their own tableau. Cold War has a player expend one of their elders or emissaries to cause chaos to an opponent with a lower combined welfare value, that is metallurgy plus immunology. Artisan allows a player to add a pawn from their free will, placing it on a card in the market as an elder. Constitution, this is a good one, allows a player to reorient a foundation and move it to its other column in their tableau. This causes the card's dissident, if present, to be removed without any further effect and does not cause a change of ruling class. It's kind of like smart preparation before a revolution. Science allows a player to search through the lore deck and retrieve one idea with an industry orientation adding it to their tableau as a new invention in their current ruling class. Now, placement of this invented idea is super important, and unlike all other invented ideas, are placed between the first invention and the species placard as though it were the oldest invention. This acts the same as inventing any idea, and the player must meet its requirements to be eligible. However, unlike inventing a new idea, invention through science does not grant a Eureka advancement. The last is pseudoscience, which works exactly the same way as science, except instead of taking an idea with an industry orientation, the player searches the lore deck for a cultural orientation. With the elder actions done, let's continue with the activities. The next one is library, 
an activity allowing players to expend a number of elders equal to their current information stage to increase it by one point up to its maximum value. Next is the elect action, which causes a player to expend all their elders and emissaries to the free will domain on their brain placard. After these pawns are returned, they then quell all their dissidents from their species placard. As usual, this causes destruction of cities and loss of migrants as the standard, but for all this destruction and loss, the player can set their ruling class to any discipline they would like, complete with the opportunity to move inventions. The last activity we'll cover is the migrant activity. But this comes in three types, and one of those types has four subtypes, so we're still going to be here a little while longer. <laughs> the first is Migrant Spread. Spread allows a player to either create a new migrant and move it, or move an existing one. New migrants begin placed on an existing migrant or a city and move from there, with any migrant allowed to be moved only once per turn, unless the player has either a war animal city, an oil city, or a uranium city. A player's maximum movement is equal to their energy stage and is spent by moving the migrant along the lines connecting each spot. For a migrant spawned at a city, their first movement must be to a spot surrounding the city. In a land-based game, players must end their movement in a land spot, but can move across a number of ocean spots equal to their current maritime level. Worth noting here that these are inclusive of the movement value granted by the energy stage and not in addition. It is simply the maximum number of ocean spots a migrant can traverse in their movement. Now this kind of brings us to habitable terrain, because for a migrant to be able to move across a path, the spot moved to needs to at least border one habitable hex. For us land-dwelling folk, these are land-based hexes without climate chits. The next migration type is an urbanized migration, and can occur one of three ways. We have cultivate, domesticate, and prospect. To take this action, a player must first expend a migrant, bordering a chosen habitable hex. Then they place the leftmost cuboid from their urbanization track into the hex as a city. To urbanize through cultivation, the city must be placed on a horticultural or biofuel location. These are colored white. To urbanize through domestication, the city must be placed on an animal icon, colored brown. Finally, to urbanize through prospecting, the city must be placed on a resource icon colored black. This one's a little more complicated though. Whether you can urbanize a hex depends on the activity used to initiate. If the icon is like this one and a pickaxe only, the player can urbanize any of the four hex types, luxury, metal, oil, or uranium. If the icon is a pickaxe with a gem, it can only be used to urbanize luxury hexes. And on the other hand, if it is a pickaxe and an ingot, it can only be used for metal. Finally, for prospecting, the player must also have a minimum technology stage as listed on the icon being urbanized. For example, for our orange migrant to be able to urbanize using the amethyst resource, they would need to have level three in metallurgy. All right, guys and gals, we're into the final stretch, the last kind of migration and this one is available only in the advanced game, is the Migrant Transactions. Here, there are four types. Trade, Preach, War, and finally, Enslave. These activities can be made against either enemy migrants or their cities. To target a migrant, a player will need to spread to their spot. While targeting a city, they will need to spread to one of the spots it is adjacent to. Trade, causes a player's migrant to be expended. However, it grants both players a negotiation bonus. Either they can gain an advancement in technology that they currently lag behind the other player, move one of their domain pawns to the free will space in the brain placard, or clear one chaos removing the dissident from a descent space. The initiating player chooses first, followed by their enemy. Now, the following three transactions are considered violent transactions, and dependent on the current philosophy, may cause the activating player to suffer a chaos as a part of the action taken. Each of these actions will destroy either an enemy city or migrant, replacing it with one of the activating players, but the requirements for each action are different. 
preach can only be utilized if a player's mysticism is higher than that of their target and can be used to remove enemy migrants or their cities, destroying them, replacing them in their player's color. Now, usually destroyed cities cause chaos, but as this one is considered an act of God, no chaos ensues. The second variant is war and can occur one of four ways. You can attack a migrant, siege a city, missile bomb a city, or nuclear bomb a city. Attacking a migrant requires both players to compare their metallurgy states. The player with the lowest value has their migrant removed from the map and added to their species board as a dissident, possibly causing a chaotic revolution. The winner's migrant replaces them. Siege targets an enemy city, and unlike attacking a migrant requires the attacker to have a higher metallurgy. The attacking migrant must be adjacent to the city, and just the same as preaching, causes the city to be destroyed and replaced in one of their colour. This unlike preaching is considered an act of man and causes the defender to suffer a chaos. The third variety of war, missile bombing, like siege, requires the attacker to have a higher level metallurgy, but it also requires the attacker to have reached level 8 on the maritime track. This, unlike Siege, does not require an adjacent migrant and can be used to target any city on the map. As usual, this causes the defending player's city to be destroyed and a new one erected in the attacking player's colour. The final type of war is nuclear bombing, and it goes back to requiring an adjacent migrant, however it drops the metallurgy requirements of war, needing only energy at level 8 to activate. This, like other attacks against cities, destroys the city, causing chaos, and creates a new city in its place. Now, nuclear bombing can actually be enhanced further if the attacking player has both energy level 8 and maritime level 8. Then, their nuclear bombs can attack any city on the map. The final type of migrant transaction is enslave, and can be used only if a player's urbanization is greater than that of their target. As with war, this can occur against an enemy migrant or an enemy city with the same base rules. A targeted migrant is removed and replaced with its attacker, and a targeted city requires an adjacent migrant. Just like all the others, this city is destroyed and replaced with one in the attacking player's colour. Remember, with all this city destruction, players suffering the loss may choose to place a refugee down. That is a free migrant in one of the adjacent spots. And that's it. Phase 2 is done. The final phase is the Footprint and Restore Market phase, and it begins with the Footprint check. Here a player evaluates whether their migrants or cities starve out, doing so by evaluating each hex where they are present. They count the number of pieces that share the hex, opponents included, and compare the number to their own footprint stage. If their footprint stage is less than the number of pieces sharing the hex, the player must remove their piece until it is not the case. If it is equal or greater, nothing happens. Every piece removed this way causes chaos, which means it's now possible to suffer revolution in every single one of the three phases of the game. Next, the market is restored, with new cards drawn to fill the gaps as required. And then finally, the player resolves a diversity check, asking other players to adjust the cubes in their diversity track to accurately reflect the number of rainbows in their tableau. Once phase three is complete, play moves to the next player. Play continues until the final comet is challenged, and endgame scoring commences. Here, players will calculate up to three different scores, their cultural score, political score, and industrial score, with the highest one of the three being compared against your competitors. Now, I've been saying up to three different scores because depending on the current philosophy, a scoring method will be unavailable. If, come endgame scoring, the philosophy cube was in the center of the track, all three scoring options are available. If it was at least two spaces deep into the industry track, a player's politics score will not be considered. If the philosophy track was at least two points deep into the politics track, the culture score would not be available. Finally, if the philosophy cube was at least two spaces deep on the culture track, industry scoring would not be available. That is why you want these bellwether cards. Final scores are calculated as follows. One victory point per victory chit in the culture section, 
one victory point per mysticism. Finally, the total value of the two environment tracks. A player's final political score is calculated at one victory point per victory chit in the politics section, one victory point per level of urbanization. Finally, the total value of the two welfare tracks. Finally, a player's industry score is calculated one victory point per victory chit on the industry section, one victory point per level of diversity, and finally one victory point for the combined value of the economy tracks. The player with the highest available score wins. There we have it, guys and gals. Practically everything for BIOS Origins. I mean, there are a couple of other rules floating around that are either just highly situational or only relevant to other game modes. Um, so we left them off the video today, but that is pretty much it. And definitely everything that you need to get playing for sure. All without giving you a headache, I hope. This image, on the other hand... <laughs> We're going to head back to the studio to just sort of sign off, but I'll leave you here with this image. <laughs> 10 points if you can find the piece that doesn't belong. See ya! There it is, guys and gals. The BIOS trilogy all wrapped up with a nice little bow. Except it's probably a couple of edges loose there because a campaign started all the way back in BIOS Genesis can be continued all the way through, even past BIOS Origins here, moving into their next game, High Frontier, and that is way beyond the scope of this, but it is a, certainly a game to get excited about for all you nerds out there. <laughs> Now, I really hope that I've given you uh, a more thorough understanding of this game. I feel like we've gone beyond the basics here, but as far as putting all the pieces together and actually seeing a game in progress, that is up to you guys, because there is nothing like seeing those pieces fit and unravel on the table in front of you. One of the things I admire most about this series and Phil's games in general, it's just the sheer possibilities that games like this can unravel. Stories can be told, impossible situations can be overcome. It's absolutely brilliant and it's all confined into these little pieces spread across your dining room table. It is truly something else. Um, so we're going to call it there. I really hope you've enjoyed this video and the preceding BIOS How to Plays. I really hope they've helped you out and from what I can see, they totally have. So. Thank you for tuning in. If you've enjoyed the video, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Do all the things that you guys can do to help this channel grow, but also just to say that this has been worth the time because this one took way too long. Um, guys and gals, as always, my name's Michael. This is Bits Aboard. We'll catch you next time.